Thank you. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. My name is Dietrich. I work for Mozilla. I've been at Mozilla for more than 12 years, which for in the tech world, really long time to stay at one job. But one of the reasons why I've stayed at Mozilla this long is because Mozilla is not just a technology company. Mozilla makes a browser. Most people know us for making Firefox. More people know the name of Firefox than the name of Mozilla, that's for sure. A couple of hundred million people use Firefox. Very few of them actually know the name Mozilla, but they all know Firefox. Many people recognize it. For me, staying at Mozilla and working on Firefox is very important because we have one job. That's to keep the internet open and free. To make it accessible by everybody. That is a very big job against the type of people that we're competing against and the type of technologies that would like to control most or all of your life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> there's all kinds of technologies that wants total market control. But for us, Firefox is a tool. We don't need to win a browser war. We don't need to have half of internet users or even 25%. We just need enough Firefox users to be able to guide the development of open technologies. And that's what we've done. Right now, all of the browsers that are most popular in the world are standards compliant, super, super fast, and almost all of them are shipping new features to the web. For us, that's a healthy, vibrant web. When all the browsers are fast and they're all shipping new stuff, that's a win for open technology, open standards, and freedom. So for us, this is why we continue to build open technology tools and why I continue to work for Mozilla after more than 10, 10 12 years now. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. The first thing I want to talk about is zero. Zero, that's the number of app installations per month that about half of Android users reported by Google had. This is in the US last year, but it signals a larger trend. How many people here have too many apps? <coughs> a lot of people. How many people here, how many people here have apps that you've installed and never used? Hmm. Almost everybody. <laughs> and they're estimating now that most people use a maximum of seven apps. Seven. If you are a technology startup, you're going to build an app, and you're just hoping people install your app. They, they don't want to install your app. They're, they're tired. People are tired of installing new apps. There's a, a commitment required to installing an app in many ways. Uh, there's a, a bandwidth commitment. Uh, I looked at my app updates the other day, and it was, uh, Facebook, Facebook Messenger, uh, what was it, Google Inbox, and there's another big one, uh, LinkedIn maybe. All of them were over 100 megs. <laughs> These are updates. And I looked at the description of what's, what's new in the app, in the release notes. Each one said, we update our app regularly to make sure that you have a better experience. <laughs> 167 megs for a Facebook Messenger. No details did not say what was in the update. Nothing. Maybe it makes you safer. Maybe it makes you not safer. Maybe it adds new features. Maybe it takes away the features you liked. There's no way to know. So it's a very complicated situation. As a, as a developer, somebody offering a new service, as a startup offering a new business, if you want people to install your app, you're facing a really tough challenge. Very challenging world right now for applications. So. Now, there's some new technologies coming around. IoT. IoT is going to eat the world, they say. It will be in everything. A lot of people talk about IoT as a vertical. No. IoT is it's a new layer in the stack. It will be in all of our technology. Uh, these types of things, they will be in our homes. Microphones, cameras in our homes. Many people do not have a problem with this. Some people have a problem with this. It doesn't really matter. It will be ubiquitous. They'll be everywhere. And that's something that, that we'll come to terms with, we'll take advantage of for the most part. But for us, it's important that consumers have a choice, that you can choose to engage in the corporate cloud ecosystem 
with a device that sits in the most intimate, personal place in your life, in your home. But what if you had the ability to have the same choice as you have every time you open a browser, where all of the diversity and vibrancy of the open web is available to you in a way that doesn't require you to commit to an ecosystem, to buy in to a corporate cloud, just to have very personal services in your home, in your life, on your body, for example. What if you walk into a room and that room is a blank slate? It's an empty room, like when you open your browser for the first time and you have no tabs open, you declare tab bankruptcy, you start from scratch. You have your choice to determine what websites you open, what tabs you open, how you interact with which services. There's no gatekeeper at this point. Nobody's making the choices for you. You have personal agency. You decide what you want to consume. And you decide how. And you decide where, if you say something, where that recording of your voice is stored, what services you get to have access to, not whether they're a partner of a corporation, or not whether that service already has their authentication set up through that service, or is paying them, or whatnot. But you have full choice over what's available to you. What if you walk into this room, and this room is the computer? You can interact with this room the way that you can interact with the entire web. That is a future that I would like to see for IoT. Not locked up in a vertical. Not belonging to one platform or another, but a physical computing world where all of these services can talk to each other the same way that, way that we can right now on the web without me having to commit. So all these technologies coming soon. Internet of Things keeps saying it's going to be big. It will, but it's not going to be big in, a, in one thing or one product or one way. It'll be the fact that uh, I have an accelerometer in here that's physical, and a microphone. These things, is that IoT? For me, the common denominator of IoT is when computing meets physicality. When people talk about IoT, the only difference between that and a, and a screen device or something like that is the fact that there's more physical interaction. You're interacting physically. It's, it's detecting your presence. It's listening to you. Maybe it's responding. Maybe it's got a, com a camera with advanced computer vision capabilities detecting your movements or something like that. Uh, AR and VR. Again, VR is going to be huge. Everybody wait. It will be, right? But probably not in the way we think it will. Again, this technology will be commodified and integrated into many different types of hardware and services, things that we experience. Uh, how many people have, have watched an entire movie in VR? Oh, no, I'm not going to raise my hand. Because I haven't, and neither of you. Why? Every day say it's going to be huge. Because right now, it's a pretty terrible experience. I mean, one, nobody has the hardware to watch a movie in VR. Very few people can afford an Oculus, or, or even if you can, it's not like you want to sit inside this headset for hours at a time, right? Maybe you try something out, you do demos. Have you played three hours of a game in VR? No, no one's doing this now because it's really awkward and uncomfortable. But the technology itself is really interesting. We can build really fun things. But right now, fun short things <laughs> for a couple of minutes, right, maximum. Nobody's hanging out for long periods of time. I mean, if anything, you start moving around, bumping into tables and things like this, right? It's just not possible at the moment. But it is going to be very interesting. The technology is going to get a lot better, a lot cheaper. Uh, artificial intelligence. People say we shouldn't even say AI. There's no intelligence there. It's just advanced mathematics, machine learning. It doesn't matter. For the consumers, it's intelligent. It seems intelligent. And that's intelligent enough to people. Again. There's no, not going to be one AI winner. It's going to be in everything. It's going to be in all of our little devices that detect when we come and go, things like this. But seems futuristic. Not really. A lot of it is basic sensors. A lot of it is built using uh, basic stuff that we have right now. Things that we have in our phones, like an accelerometer, right? Uh, every phone has one. Your accelerometer is used in your phone when you pick it up to put it by your head. They use the accelerometer in the OS on your phone 
to determine whether you should shut off the screen so your ear doesn't open an app, right? Every time you put your phone to your head, the screen turns off. On, off, on, off, using proximity sensors, accelerometer, different gestures to know what you're doing. Very physical technology. You can do this from web APIs right now. Uh, if I set my phone down, nothing's happening. What if my phone moves? Well, it means I picked it up. Or it means there was an earthquake. Or it means somebody else picked it up. If I'm not holding it <laughs> and my phone moves, then maybe there's a problem, right? <laughs> really interesting things you can learn from these APIs that you have on your phone right now. Uh, microphone, the Get User Media API in JavaScript allows you to access the microphone from a web page, which is, is pretty interesting. You can speak into it. Uh, you can maybe record speech. It can detect noises, things like this. There's a lot to learn from that. Uh, the camera, you can take photos from a web page. You can take video. You can alter video. I'll talk a little bit about that. And the speaker gives you a way to give audio feedback. Right? Your phone can speak to you. There's a lot of stuff about asking Siri to do things or asking, asking OK Google, which apparently they couldn't think of a good name maybe to, to do things. But it can tell you things as well. You know, car, car mode, some people are using this. All these are things you can do on your phone. <laughs> Speech, I think, is interesting. But like if any of you right now started talking to your phone, everybody in the room would go, that's super rude <laughs> to talk to your phone in the middle of a group of people. Nobody's doing that. There's a reason why, because it's, it's awkward social construct, right? Interrupting somebody, ignoring somebody, right? It's not really OK. But noise, I think, is really interesting. Noise tells you lots of things. Noise tells us, besides my voice, this guy just walked in the door. We could hear it. <laughs> we know something happened, right? Maybe we don't know what happened, but we know something happened. With web APIs, you can do things like record. You can know if something happened. So right now, this web page is using the microphone on my laptop to know that I am talking. It knows when there's noise and when there's silence. Everybody, make a lot of noise. Ah! Oh. See? Yeah. <laughs> now be really quiet. We know when someone's home. The computer knows when someone got home from work or got home from school. Uh, or if you're at work, it knows that your kids got home from school. It sends you a notification. Or it knows that the cat's hungry. Maybe you forgot to feed the cat today. It knows by the presence and absence of sound that something's happened in a physical space. So I was doing things like set up some code, plug my phone in, leave it running this all day long at home, and then I would get a notification over IFTTT anytime that decibel level would go above a certain level. Then I would know when things were happening inside my house. Not what, of course, but I would know that, oh, okay, a big sound happened. Maybe you could add a little bit of recording using Media Recorder API. Sends you a five second snippet of what the sound was maybe. Or you use Get User Media and just take a snapshot. Every time decibel level goes above a certain level, take a snapshot, send it to you. You have this personal bot that sends you a photo every time there's a sound in your house. Big sound anyway, right? You don't really care about the, the cat. Uh, it depends on you and your cat's relationship. I won't get involved there. But things you can know by presence and absence. This room could greet you as you come in and tell you what the schedule of events is today just by going from zero sound to some sound. Camera. We have camera access inside web pages with Get User Media for many years now. People have done a lot of experiments, but for me, I'm, I'm less interested in, in uh, you know, just taking photos or making a video or something. I'm interested in what I can learn from the camera, right? Like, it's pretty basic. You're like, okay, hi, everybody. You can see me. It's kind of cool. You can do things like WebRTC, maybe have a video conference. But there are a lot of better apps for that. There's some good websites for that that people are using. Uh, but what if we can add new things to what the camera can see and do, right? So if we add some things, 3D objects inside the camera space. Oh, I wish I had the other slide back on with the noise, because then it would have caught that. But so now, imagine augmented reality. Augmented reality is where, instead of virtual reality, 
we take the regular world that we see and we overlay objects onto it. This is something you can do with the camera API. Using your camera, I can overlay Pokemon <laughs> flying around this room. I can add a duck into the space. Uh, in this room, maybe we have something like a Bluetooth beacon with the URL to the schedule of talks in this room. You don't need to install an app at this point. Maybe it just opens up the FOSS Asia schedule page to what's showing in this room. Uh, if you have Google nearby on your phone installed, uh, or any Beacon app, you walk into this room and you would get a notification. You wouldn't even have to look for a URL or type it in or scan it. You'd walk in, get a notification, open up a web page. It's kind of interesting. Now imagine you walk in, get the notification, click the URL and open a web page, which opens up an augmented reality view using today's technology with no app install required. You can do these things with the web today. You can do these things with Bluetooth beacons, especially as beacon technology is going to become more ubiquitous, baked into operating systems, to be more available. So we take the same camera view. We add, instead of 3D this time, we add a little JavaScript. And we try to do some, let's we'll see if this will work, detection. It detects where my eyes are. You can detect a person. You can use the camera to detect and add something to someone. You could even do augmented reality like Snapchat filters and stuff like this inside of a web page. Uh, you can do things like with more advanced JavaScript, you could put a little work in, do some more recognition, types of people, somebody's happy or sad, fun things like this, but without having to install different apps, right? And in a way that people can take this code, share it with each other, and develop the algorithms to be more and more accurate. Right now, these are some very basic examples. But all of this stuff works today. And the barrier to entry for developing these types of things is very, very low. HTML, JavaScript, uh, a mobile phone, or here even a, 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 de a laptop. But most people in the world, you know, this, this is their computer. And going forward, it will continually be the only computer that most people are using. So finding ways to share and distribute this low barrier to entry technology to more people means that they don't have to wait until they can afford a Google Home or Alexa. You can take your old smartphone and set up these types of things today, getting a lot of similar features from it. Now let's say we take the camera, we add some 3D, we also add a little bit of JavaScript, and then you can start doing also more fun things. Ways to interact the page that actually detect and work with you. This one, just experimental, sometimes works, not so well, sometimes so well. But you can do things like track objects, augment people that you experience. Imagine something like this when you're at a larger event. Super fun. A little bit of JavaScript to access to camera and microphone. These APIs have been around a long time. Not really a lot of mystery here. Pretty good support from uh, Firefox, Chrome, browsers on Android. On iOS, can't access the camera can't access the microphone. But iOS also, you can't access 95% of smartphone owners in the world. So <laughs> by building these things for Android, using the web, you still have access to 95% of smartphone owners in the entire planet, which is really, really powerful. And for me, something that when I demo this, I like to be able to say, here, please, all people in the audience try this. But I'm sorry, iPhone owners, you're going to have to lean over and see what the Android people are saying. <laughs> because your smartphone manufacturer has decided you are not ready for these features yet. Sorry. <laughs> so the 3D tools that I've been using to build some of these examples, this one is called A-Frame. There was a talk on A-Frame earlier by this guy over here. How many people were in the A-Frame and VR talk earlier? A couple of people. If you haven't heard of A-Frame, it's, for me, basically like how jQuery changed people's ability to build for the web. Over half of websites on the planet using jQuery at one point or another. For me, A-Frame is that tool for building 3D content on the web. It allows you to declaratively build 3D worlds using simple HTML tags. It has primitives like uh, a sphere, cube, cylinder. It has an extensibility system 
that you can build your own components in the A-frame to build more sophisticated things. It can import OBJ files, so you can import all of 3D models that are openly available right now into a web page without a plugin required. It's built on top of WebGL and 3JS to make it very easy to build 3D content. Makes it great for building virtual reality content. We've been having a lot of fun building augmented reality content using camera view like this in web pages. Really, really, really interesting tool. And I expect you're gonna be hearing a lot more about A-Frame over time. Already in this conference, many people, and we've talked about A-Frame, they've, they've already heard of it. It's a very, very easy tool. And by design, it's very easy to integrate into whatever JavaScript and web framework that you're using today. Integrating into React or Angular, these types of things, because it's declarative, makes it very easy because these are toolkits that emit markup, makes it easy to integrate A-Frame into them. Uh, the URL, aframe.io, has a bunch of examples and documentation. One of the things that's made A-Frame very successful is the fact that it has a very strong community. If you have questions about A-Frame, there are many places to go ask, and they're all listed on the website, and it's a very responsive community. So a lot of people have had success building things on top of A-Frame. This is an example. So the source code that I just showed you, you can see cube, cylinder. You can use HTML attributes on these tags to be able to modify color, size, position. You even have a tag for the camera view. So you can say where the camera point of view is in the 3D space. You can determine where the light source is coming from, or even multiple light sources. These are very powerful tools where a lot of the complicated parts have been abstracted away. What has typically been restricted to very advanced gaming SDKs is now available in markup in a web page through A-Frame, which is very, very powerful and easy to use. And on mobile phones, here I can interact with it in this way. On mobile phones, A-Frame detects the accelerometer. And if you come by the Mozilla booth, we have a bunch of demos of where we're showing VR in a web page that responds to your motion. It can't do advanced position detection like Oculus or Vive, but it can detect motion through the gyroscope and accelerometer. Uh, the APIs I've discussed today, all available on MDN. If you haven't been to MDN, it's the reference for the web API. The reference for the web. Contributors from all over, Mozilla, other projects, many volunteers, and it's probably available in the language of your country as well because we have teams of localizers that volunteer their time to translate it. If you're interested in learning more about some of these APIs, MDN is a website to go to. So this is the new web that we're looking at. As IoT technologies start to proliferate, do we want to install one app for everything in our life? Do we want to have 18 apps to manage our house? Probably not. Very high friction. Convincing someone to install an app is incredibly difficult. Convincing someone to open a URL, very easy. So the friction to onboard new users in, say, smart cities. What if you go to a smart city and you have to install apps for all different parts of the city. Your user engagement in your smart city program or project is gonna be pretty poor. If you just need to open a URL to engage with a physical space, user engagement becomes much higher. It's much easier to onboard new users without that type of commitment. And using a universal deployment surface that every phone everywhere will support, which is very powerful. So if we don't want to see a future where our choices are restricted to high-end products, to single company ecosystems. And I think you're gonna see a lot more of this even from those companies as they realize these frictions in onboarding the users. The path forward is the universal deployment system that you already have. The one that works regardless of any device, which is using web technologies to bring advanced technologies to as many people as possible instead of just the customers that buy into a specific ecosystem. So, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. If you have any questions, I'll be at the Mozilla booth for the rest of the day. Please come by and talk. Thanks. Three minutes. All right. Uh, 
Ah, uh, so there, there are a number of different libraries for doing basic computer vision stuff on image data in JavaScript. I think this one we use Head Tracker, JS or something. There's so many of them. And uh, actually using WebAssembly, you can convert binary, binary uh, computer vision libraries into JavaScript and use them against the data that you imported through the camera data. It's pretty trivial these days. And one of the things that's interesting is that this demo even works on like middle range Android phone. This is fairly performant. Uh, but I think as the algorithms get better, and as more people start, start using these types of libraries, it's going to take less computational power than it does now, for sure, to be able to do the same type of image processing and basic computer vision. You won't get the type of really advanced computer vision that you can when you have dedicated graphics cards and things like this, but useful enough for the types of common cases that really are in most IoT use cases. Did someone show up? Is someone there? Someone not there? Did they move? Say something. This is the most common types of use cases where you're not using really advanced. You don't need uh, 25 points per hand tracking, right? If you just need if a hand went up or not, not too difficult to do with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Yeah? So um, I was wondering whether it's possible to get a handle on the lag, because I noticed that the lag in the system was quite bad. So can you like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff uh, all the way? Like, like, yeah. Like yeah, so it, it, it depends on device, for one, uh, and depends on other system load, like any performance problem, right? So there are things you can do to optimize it. Uh, right now, you're also, we're relying camera access in web pages is usually going through another layer of abstraction than would be native camera access, right? Uh, on the phones, it really depends. But the, I think you really want to optimize for your use case. So even though you won't get pure native performance, just like you can get close to native in some web applications for some purposes, but for this, it's going to be even a little bit slower than that generally. You want to focus on your use case. If your use case requires absolute fidelity, then maybe this isn't the right solution, right? But if you need generalized, approximate fidelity, you need to know if somebody came in or left, if somebody's moving, raise a hand, raise a fist, this type of stuff, you don't need you know, less than 15 millisecond response time. If you have 200 milliseconds response time, it's gonna be all right. Also, this is not even optimized code. Some of these demos I put together just in the last couple of days, so you can definitely do more optimization than this, for sure. But you know, you're, you're never, it's never gonna be exactly on par with pure native. But if you can be a little bit behind, that's fine. Right now, uh, then this is a question I get all the time. Can it be faster? This is a question you get about everything. Most of the native apps I use aren't that fast. My Android phones, whether it's the high-end one or the not high-end one, can hang repeatedly, multiple times every day. So that question applies no matter what kind of application you're putting it to, really. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, yes, I'll put a link on, I'll tag it with Foss Asia hashtag on Twitter. Yeah. How much is web assembly um, for both on the browser side as well as for the web? What was the beginning part? Uh, how much is web assembly? Oh, on the web assembly 1.0 just shipped. So, mature enough to ship in production, but brand new. <laughs> I think the, the bigger questions there are what uses can we put web assembly to? I think the technology is there. It's not available in all browsers yet, but I'm interested more to see with, now that it is available, what people are gonna do with it, what type of applications we're going to be able to see in WebAssembly. But absolutely, a brand new technology. We're just beginning to see the uses of it, and it's only shipped in production well, last week in Firefox, I think. All right, I think we're out of time, yes? Two more minutes. <laughs> Any other question? I have a question. Yeah? How far behind are the desktop browser versions versus the mobile versions? Uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, I work with WebRTC. Ah, yeah. Um, I get version last week. Yeah. Um, and it was a pain to kind of see it working on the desktop and then move to a mobile phone yeah. because that's where people really want to use it. Yeah. Yeah, some of the API is not implemented. I feel your pain because just today I was using Get User Media, one of the WebRTC APIs, and you have a facing mode attribute. You can choose whether to use the front camera or back camera. 
selfie mode or room mode. But on Firefox, it just prompts you and you have a pull down. You can choose which one or you can specify. On Chrome, it doesn't do either. It only has selfie mode, <laughs> nothing else on Android. <laughs> They just assume everybody's so selfish, they're just going to point it at themselves, and that's it. But for augmented reality, you really want to be able to point out at the world around you, right? Not supported on Chrome and Android yet. So it's really, it's really difficult right now. WebRTC, especially. It's a pretty large set of APIs, as you probably know. Somewhat complicated. There's some good abstraction libraries out there for using it. Kind of like A-Frame abstracts 3JS, extracts WebGL, right? But WebRTC also has abstraction libraries to make it easier. But again, capability support kind of goes up and down, especially on mobile. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it really is. And so like, it depends on the, again, I think it depends on the type of use case, what you're building. And, and uh, if you're building a uh, production level video conferencing system, it's gonna be really challenging to do that on mobile with WebRTC without specifying at least, you know, these two browsers and these versions and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's really challenging right now. But hopefully it's going to get better. More and more browsers are implementing more parts of WebRTC. Like we haven't even implemented the full WebRTC spec yet. And obviously with the facing mode stuff, Chrome hasn't either, right? So there's still some work to go there. Another question has, uh, you spoke about IoT. Yeah. Um, there, there, there are a lot of use cases around discovery devices. You want to onboard somebody yeah. to uh, use a device. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they give you access to VPN and things. But there, there was some work on the discovery API on the, on the browser side. Yeah. But uh, I think because of security concerns. So it's yeah. So there's, there's a couple of different things, right? Um, Bluetooth beacons, that's something that's getting. Uh, I th I, I'm betting we're going to see it built into Android sooner or later, right? They're pushing physical web and stuff pretty hard at Google right now. Uh, I would not be surprised if we see that. iBeacons on iOS, things like that. A way to project a URL onto a, directly to a device. That's, that's great because you don't need to be on the same local network, right? If you're not on the same local network, that gives you a lot more flexibility for people to onboard onto something through beacons. Uh, then local network discovery, another thing like MDNS discovery of things. Uh, Mozilla had a project called FlyWeb. We were looking into how can you dynamically from the web detect MDNS entities and be able to connect to discover services and then connect to them that so way, that which maybe? it's off by default right now in Nightly, but check out FlyWeb. It's a way that we're looking into the possibility of trying to do something like that. Uh, but I have, I have another talk where I talk about just that bit about the onboarding of people from physical from physical space into digital space using things like like QR code is the is the the original physical computing right the original way using a QR code that you can connect from a purely physical space into a digital experience it's, it's awkward and terrible but it's everywhere right and a lot of phones people know how to use it generally uh, uh, NFC is another one tap to transport from a physical place into digital I think there are going to be more options as physical computing becomes built more into the operating systems themselves. But right now, yeah, it's, it's still pretty tough, even if you're on the same local network to discover a device. Yeah. Okay, thank you.